Lord God, we need you right now, God. Today, this week, this season, we celebrate you coming into the world, God. You seeing us in our broken state. You seeing our need and you coming in and coming into our hearts and changing us and taking us from this place, taking us from the darkness, God, taking us from the pain that's inside of us, Lord God. You recognize our, our, our plight, Lord God. You came and rescued us. You came in right on time when we need you. God, every time we cry out to you in those moments, God, when we need you, you come through, Lord God, and you answer. God, you allow us to feel your presence, Lord God. So today, Lord, as we look in the scripture, God, let us see your glory, how you came into this world when there was so much need, when it was bad at the fulfillment, at the right time, you said, I'm coming in. I'm coming in. I see your plight. I'm coming in. I'm redeeming you. I'm bringing you to myself. I'm removing the blindness. I'm removing the darknesses. I'm, I'm showing my glory. God, it is you. God, I, I pray that you helped today just to reveal your glory again. Reveal your glory in the scriptures. As we look at your word that you inspired, help us to see you clearly, Lord God. The shoe we look to, God, decrease me, God, help your words to flow forth. Bring revelation and understanding, God. As eyes look on the page, God, jump out of the page into the heart to see your glory and who you are and what you've done and why we celebrate you, not just today, but on every day. Jesus, this is our prayer request. Amen. 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 I'm on. So, uh, just a little background. I was thinking about the Christmas message, and part of me was like, ah, uh, it's Christmas, you know, when we're doing night, it's a little short, cute Christmas message, you know, a little fluffy, if you will. But as I begin to go into scriptures, I'm like, oh, wow, God, this is not going to be a typical Christi- Christmas message. So, um, it may not be what you expect on a Christmas message, if you will. But if you just look in the text, you're going to see the glory of God. And so uh, today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 32. Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 32. This is after the birth of Christ. And a title, Fernando... The title would be The Heart of Simeon's Joy, colon, Christmas Every Day. The Heart of Simeon's Joy, colon, Christmas Every Day. This is Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 32. So I'm going to read it and come back and discuss it. And I'm reading out of the NASB, so... It may sound a little different if you have something else. Colon, Christmas every day. Christmas every day. So I'm going to just start in 21 and just kind of go down. It says, and when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for his purification, according to the laws of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. 25. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, Messiah, anointed one. 27. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bond servant to depart in peace according to your word. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The glory of your people, Israel. The heart of Simeon's joy, Christmas, every day. So today we're going to go behind the scenes and we're going to look at the source of Simeon's joy. And, and what I hope to show you is that Simeon's joy should be your joy at Christmas. His joy should be your joy at Christmas. His joy metaphorically represents every person that has decided to hope in God no matter how bad the circumstances are. So his joy should be your joy. Now, let me bring up the speed what's happening here. So 40 days have since passed since Mary had delivered Jesus. So 40 days have since passed since Mary had delivered Jesus. How do we know that 40 days have since passed? Because of Leviticus 12. According to the law, when a woman had a baby, she was unclean for seven days. And after that, there was a 33-day purification process. So that's 40 days. And during this, uh, during this purification process, Mary could not go into the temple. She couldn't go into the sanctuary. She couldn't touch anything holy. She couldn't do any of these things. She had this purification process. So she had to wait out this purification process until she could go into the temple. Now, I know to some of you, this may sound a bit strange, right? Some of my ladies are, are saying, hold on, she just went to 12 to 18 hours of labor with this baby, and she can't even go to church and, and praise and worship? I mean, th that makes no sense. But, but what you must understand, this is kind of like some grace really by God, because she's now going to have this time where she's not going to go back to her normal work schedule. Now she's going to lay up. She's going to get a lot of baby bonding time just with the with the baby. So she's not going to go to the church, but she's going to be able to just lay up and hopefully her husband's taking care of her and she has this baby uh, bonding time. But this also shows us something else with her being unclean and not able to go into the sanctuary. In this, we see how the sacrificial system of clean and unclean comes to uh, clarity in here. It sh we see how Man and God, because of our sinful state, we see in Mary been unclean how holy God is. See, that's what the sacrificial system was. It was really to show the people how holy God is and how clean or unclean we are not. So God had different rules where you couldn't enter into the temple if you had touched a dead person or if you had a discharge of blood. You had all of these things which would constantly show the children of Israel God is so holy and set apart that if you are unclean, if you're not clean, you cannot go in his presence. So again, we see that happening even here with Mary. She couldn't go into the temple because of her uncleanliness. So 40 days has passed now. The time of her purification is up. And so Mary and her husband Joseph are now going to the temple to present Jesus according to the custom of the law. According to the custom of the law, the, in the law, you would bring your first male child to the Lord and you would present him unto the Lord. So Mary's process or her purification process has ended. So now she can go in the sanctuary and they're, they're committed. They're, they're trying to be devout Jews. And so now they're bringing their child, the baby Jesus, into the temple to present him unto the Lord. Now, as some of you guys know, um, I grew up in the black church tradition, the black church Christian tradition. And one of the first things that happens when a, when a parent, when parents have a child, one of the first things that happens is the, the parents, they bring the child before the church and they present him to the Lord. Or you heard somebody say, have you Christian my child yet? That's, that's where, that's the basis of where many uh, churches get this, uh, this teaching or it is not teaching, but this custom or this tradition, they get it from here. So in a black church culture, when you had a child, you would bring them before the church. You would get them godparents who would also disciple him and help raise him. And you, they would go before the church and the church would pray for the child, his future, how God's going to use them. The church would then pray for the parents. And the church would also pray for the godparents. And so this is the basis of where this comes from. Now, 
that custom, I don't want to get too much into it. That's not a, a religious thing. That's not something, a commandment in scripture that you have to do, but it's just a custom that people do to honor the Lord and to pray for the parents and the child. So that is the, the, the basis of where we get that from. So we have that here in this text. We see that Mary and Joseph, they're doing a similar thing. They're going to the temple. They're taking their firstborn child and they're going to present them to the Lord. They're going to offer up a, a sacrifice. And we see that Mary and Joseph, they were poor. We know that they were poor because if you had money, you would offer up a lamb normally. When your first uh, male child was born, you would normally offer up a lamb. But because they were poor, they couldn't afford a lamb. So what they could afford was two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So that is what they offered. So that tells you that Jesus was not born to a rich family. And this also gives us a better perspective on Jesus' care and concern for the poor. I think about Hebrews 4, uh, 14, where it shows the relatability of Jesus to the common sinner, because the scripture tells us how Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in all things yet without sin. Meaning that Christ knew what it felt like to be talked about. He, he knew what it felt, uh, felt like to be unjustly condemned. He, he knew what it felt like also, according to this text, to be poor. Jesus knew what it felt like to be poor. Remember, Jesus was a carpenter, which meant he was a part of the working class people. And all throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament, you see that God has a heart for the poor. And because God has a heart for the poor, so should we. We should have a heart for the poor, not wondering how they became poor or why they are poor. But if a person is down and in need, we as followers of Christ made in his image, made in God's image, should reach out our hand and give them help. So now we get to the verse 25. And we start the encounter of Simeon. And the text says, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. So the text says that Simeon was righteous and devout, meaning that he was not a nominal Jew, meaning he was not a, a Jew in nature or in name. He was not just one of those, those people that carry the title. You know, you have some people that say that they're Christian, right? They just are Christian in name only, but their life does not reflect Christ. There's nothing Christian about them. They just have this name Christian because maybe they were raised up in a Christian household or, or maybe they went to church. And so they carry this name Christian, even though they're not really a Christian. But this says about Simeon here that he was righteous and devout, meaning that he was committed to his faith. Meaning that he was committed to keeping the law, meaning that he was not a hypocrite. Because when we read the scriptures sometimes, particularly when it's talking about the Pharisees, it'll call them hypocrites. But with this gentleman right here, he was the real deal because the scripture says that he was righteous and the devout. So we have Simeon, this righteous and devout fella, Simeon, the real deal, I want to call him. And he's looking, the scripture says, he's looking for the consolation of Israel, the consolation of Israel. Think about this word consolation. It has in its root word console, right? Console meaning you want to comfort somebody. But why would someone need to be consoled or comforted? And why would an entire nation need to be consoled or comforted? The reason somebody wants to be comforted or consoled is because something has gone wrong. Something has gone awry. Things are not as they should be. There's some problem. There's some issue that's going on where you need to have comfort, where you need to be consoled. And so that's what we're finding here. And it's not just an individual that needs to be consoled or comforted. But according to the text, it's an entire nation that is waiting for consolement, that is waiting for comfort. Meaning that there's a really big problem going on. That this whole nation is waiting to be comforted, waiting to be consoled. It reminds me of America after 9-11. Do you remember America after 9-11? 
That was a time when the nation as a whole needed to be consoled, needed to be comforted. They wanted help. We had just been attacked by terrorists and, and people didn't know what to do and they were, they were fearful. They didn't, they had no idea. There was no peace. They needed to be comforted. And that is the case with the Jewish people at this time. They were looking for comfort. Why? Because of their iniquities and transgressions against God, he allowed them to be overtaken by their enemies. When I say iniquities and transgression, I want to explain to you what these words mean. Iniquity has its root meaning, meaning uh, crooked or crooked or bent. See, the children of Israel, they were bending and twisting God's ways to fit their own agenda. And not only that, where they did they have iniquities with a with a crooked ways, but the scripture says that because of their transgressions as well, transgressions has a root meaning of rebel, rebel. So when you put it together, it was because of their crooked ways, because of their rebellion against God, God had allowed their enemies to overtake them. They were no longer the dominant force. They, don't, they were no longer that feared power. And not only that, they were separated between them and their God. There was a big gap there. So they were, they were missing God. There was a dark cloud over Israel. They no longer were in power. They were um, occupied by the Romans. But yet, even in this moment, there were some in Israel that still were hoping in God. They were still hoping that God was going to come through and redeem Israel, that God was going to come through. Even though it was a dark cloud, even things were all bad, they still had this hope that God was going to do something. And one of those devotees is this gentleman we're looking at here, Simeon. See, they remember what God promised to Abraham in Genesis 22, where the Lord said that he would bless Abraham, that all nations will be blessed through him. They remembered the promises. And so did Simeon. Simeon was clinging to God's promises. That's what the scripture says. He was waiting for the consolation. So even though things were bad, even though things look bad, even though they were under the occupation of another enemy, even though things were so horribly bad, yet Simeon still was holding out hope. See, our brother Simeon is the perfect example of a person walking by faith and not by sight because things are all bad around him. He's waiting, this text says, he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for the comfort. So even though things are bad, he is still holding. He is still clinging to God's promises. See, we can learn a lesson from Simeon here. To cling to God's promises, even when it is dark, even when it looks like there's no way out. He is still holding out hope. His faith, his trust is in God, that God is going to come through, that God is going to deliver. See, right now in our nation, there's many people who are afraid. They're afraid because of government. They are afraid because of who's in power. But guess what? That is not where our faith needs to be. Our faith is not in government. It's not about those who are in power, but our faith should be as Simeon in the promises in the word of God. Now I want you to notice something. Even though things are bad, Simeon is waiting He's waiting there. Even though God has not answered his prayer yet, Simeon is still waiting there. And a the text says that he was righteous and devout, meaning that even though God has not yet answered Simeon's prayer, even though God has not come through yet, Simeon is still committed to keeping God's word. He is still committed to keeping the commandments. That's why the text said he was righteous and devout. So even though he, he is praying, he's hoping, he's waiting for God to come through, even though he recognized that there's darkness all in the nation and things are not as they should be, yet Simeon is not allowing his character to change. He's still committed to living a holy life during the waiting period. During the waiting period, he is still committed to the commandments of God. He is still committed to the ways of God. He is not changing. He's not going astray. He's still just waiting righteously. 
So I want to ask you this, my brothers and sisters, what are you doing during your waiting period? How are you acting and behaving in your waiting period? What are you doing after the night when you've been crying all day on your knees, asking God to deliver, asking God to change you, asking God to change a person, asking God to change a circumstance? What do you do the next day during your waiting period when you're waiting for God to come through? What are you doing when you've been praying and fasting all night and yet God has not answered your prayer? What do you do in that waiting period? Will you still go out and live righteous and devout as Simeon did? Will you still keep clinging to God's words and his promises? Will you still keep praying even though your knees are hurt from bending down and praying and asking and asking God to change and asking God to come into the circumstance? Will you still stay committed and devout to God's word? What will you do in your waiting period? How, how do you respond? Will you respond like the zealots or Judas who got tired of waiting for God? God was taking too long. I'm praying, God, I'm asking, but you're not coming through. So I'm going to take things into my own hands and make it happen. I'm going to make it happen on my own. Is that what you're going to do in your waiting period? Are you going to be like the, the, the Sadducees who to get what they wanted compromised just a little bit? Doing their waiting period because God was taking too long. So they wanted to, to buddy, buddy up and get close with the Romans and do whatever they could so that they can stay in power. Will you do that? Will you compromise in your waiting period? What will you do in your waiting period? How will you respond? Will you be like our brother Simeon? So you must understand the context of these first century Jews at this time. It had been 400 years since they had received a fresh anointed word from God. Malachi was a long time ago. They haven't had a fresh anointed word. So during this time, people grew impatient. That's why Judas and, and the zealots went and did the things that they did. They were impatient. They, they couldn't wait for God anymore. So they're saying, God, where are you? I, I know you made these promises to our father. I, I know the scripture says that you're coming, that you will come and deliver us. But, but where are you? Uh, we're, we're still here. I watched my, my grandmother pray and now she passed away. And yet those promises haven't come. I, I watched my cousin pray and they passed away. And yet those promises haven't come. So, so God, where are you? Where is this Messiah that's going to come redeem us? Where is this Messiah that's going to come and make everything right? I, I've seen all your holy people pass away hoping and saying that a Messiah was going to come and change things, but where is he? See, that is the circumstance of these first century Jews right here. They're wondering, they're looking around and they're saying, they're saying, where is this Messiah that you promised? When are things going to change? They're looking around, wondering where he is, like some of us. Some of us been praying, saying, God, when are you going to do it? God, when are you going to answer? When are you going to respond? When are you going to take this out of me? When are you going to change me? When are you going to remove this thing that blocks me? When are you going to set me free? You are wondering and you are getting impatient. But take a page from my brother Simeon's book and keep the faith. And we see it in verse 25. I like how 25 ends. As a matter of fact, it says, Remember, Simeon's righteous and devout. The B portion says, looking for the consolation of Israel. And here's the part I love how 25 ends. And it says, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So now Simeon, in his waiting, after remaining committed to God, even though things look dark, even though things look, look dim, he's still committed, he's still waiting, and look what God does. God sends himself. He sends himself in the form of the Holy Spirit. Look, he sends the comforter to provide the comfort that he's waiting for. Do you, do you see that? He sends the Holy Spirit, the comforter, to provide comfort because Simeon is waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting to be comforted and consoled. And, and God goes and he sends the Holy Spirit, the comforter. And what does the comforter reveal to him? The Comforter reveals to him 
It says in verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ, the Messiah. So the comforter reveals that you will see the Messiah before you die, Simeon. You're going to see the Messiah before you pass, Simeon. What you've been looking for, what you've been holding out hope for, what you've been praying about, what you've been fasting about, what you've been keeping committed to the Lord about, guess what, Simeon? I know it took a while, but guess what? It's going to come. You're going to see. You're going to see with your eyes. You're going to see the glory. You're going to see what you've been praying for, what you've been hoping for. You're going to see him before you pass. This is a big statement right here. And the reason this is a big statement about the Holy Spirit revealing this is because in Israel, there was a fear of death in Israel. Just like there's a fear of death in our society right now. I mean, there was a fear of death in Israel. And that fear of death was related to sin because they knew that God would judge sin. I mean, they watched the priests daily slit the necks of bulls and goats and blood offered up. And so there was this fear of death. And the judgment of God coming. And because of that, they clung to the law. They, they were clinging to the law. And that law actually held them in a type of bondage. And I was going to go into, into detail, but you can find more about that in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, when it talks about the bondage because of the fear of death that they were in. But Simeon, this was not the case with Simeon. Simeon, this was not the case with him of having that fear. See, the scripture says that Simeon had a peace because the Holy Spirit revealed that he would see the Messiah. See, the Messiah was a sign of God's redemption. The, the coming of the Messiah was a sign that Israel's sins would be forgiven. So like the Holy Spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted, the Holy Spirit leads Simeon into the temple. Can you just imagine the Holy Spirit saying to Simeon, today, this day, Simeon, you are going to see the Messiah. I, I can imagine Simeon waking up and, and, and eating his breakfast or whatever it may be, and he's walking to the temple knowing that today is the day I'm going to see what I've been praying for. I'm going to see what the fathers and the prophets talked about. I'm going to see the glory of God. I'm going to see it today. Things are going to change today. See, he's... Walking with anticipation that today he's going to see this Messiah that the nation of Israel has been waiting for. The redemption, he's going to see it. See, now we're getting to the heart of Simeon's joy. See, I can imagine Simeon's just waiting there and, and he's seeing parents with their babies come in and out. And then the Holy Spirit, like he did with John, revealing that Jesus was the Messiah, says, Simeon. There he is. There he is. That's the Messiah. That's the one you've been waiting for. There he is. When the parents go and they bring the child, Simeon, can you just imagine the glee and the jubilation? Because he probably knew the scripture. And so as he's holding the child Jesus in his hand, I'm sure verses like Zephaniah 3, 14 and 15 came to mind where the scripture says, Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgment against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. Not only was the Lord in this midst, but he's holding the Lord, the baby child in his hand. Or verses like Micah 7, 18 to 20 probably came to mind where it says, Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham which you swore to our forefathers from the days of old. So the coming of the Messiah, the child, it means that God's judgment against Israel 
What's up? I mean, that their sin was going to be removed, that they can now enter back into an intimate fellowship with God. Ultimately, this means that God, they get God the prize because their sin was now going to be removed. And now they can be restored back into that intimate, faithful, um, that relationship with the Lord. See, that's gospel right there. Sin being removed. So now that you can enter into a real deep and abiding relationship with God, see, with sin in a way, there is no relationship. There's a big gulp. You see, you see, when we go out and we do street evangelism and we, and we do the cross and we show how man is on one side and, and God is on this other side. And there's no way to get to the other side unless you have this sin removed. That is why the world, when they say they know God, they don't know God. If your sin has not been removed, you don't know God. You haven't entered into a relationship. But we see this is why Simeon is rejoicing, because he realizes this is what's taking place. Simeon is rejoicing just as his Mary is singing her magnificent. I think about here in, in, in chapter 1, verse 54, when, when Mary, by the Holy Spirit, begins to talk, she says this. She says, he has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. See, mercy is, I mean, Mary is, is reflecting back on what God said in the past, how he was going to come and deliver them. Yes, even though they were enemies of God, God had promised that he was going to show mercy to them. So Mary is saying, this is now happening. The birth of my child is the proof of God's promises that he's going to show mercy to his servant Israel. Or you can look at what Zechariah said in uh, chapter 1, verse 68, John the Baptist father, he said this. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. See, blessed be the Lord God. God has visited us through Christ, through the baby that is in you. Zechariah also says this in 76 to 78. He says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because the tender mercy of God, which the sunrise from on high, will visit us. So do you see why Simeon is rejoicing here? He's rejoicing because the dark cloud over Israel has been removed. They can now get back into an intimate fellowship with God. See, the, the reason I titled this message, Every Day is Christmas, is because of this. Simeon is holding baby Jesus on day 40. He was not there at the birth of Jesus. He didn't see the delivery. He did not watch Jesus come out the womb. But it was the day, so or basically you can say that Simeon missed Christmas, right? Because he wasn't there the day that Jesus was born. But Simeon experienced Christmas all over the day he held his salvation in his hands. The day that God revealed the glory of himself in his son. See, Christmas is the day when you have encountered Christ. Christmas is the day when Jesus was birthed alive in you, when he came alive in you. It doesn't matter about a day. It is that day when you touch the hand of God, when you beheld the glory of Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. See, that is Christmas. It was Christmas all over for Simeon. Even though he wasn't there on day one, it was the day that he encountered Christ. That was Christmas. That's what Christmas is. It's the day that Jesus Christ comes alive and he is birthed in you and you behold his glory. As Simeon said, he was able to see his salvation with his eyes. The Holy Spirit revealed the child. That is Christmas when you see Jesus in his glory. That is what we celebrate. Have you had your Christmas? Have you seen the glory of Christ? Simeon did. He felt the hand of God as he touched the baby. That's Christmas when you encounter the Lord, when he's birthed alive inside of you. Let's look at verse 29 here, 
32. I just want to read this part. It says, now the Lord, you are releasing your bond servant to depart in peace. Simeon said, okay, I can go now. There's no more fear and death. There's no guilt. You promise you're going to forgive. You deliver your, your, your promise. So I'm good now. He says, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon said, I'm good. I can depart in peace. He has comfort. Fear of death, no, no longer. But how can Simeon have this peace? Simeon, you're just holding a baby. Simeon, you're just holding a baby. This baby can't even talk yet, Simeon. All this baby can do is goo goo gaga. Simeon, he hasn't, you haven't heard him say anything, Simeon. Simeon, you haven't seen the baby child grow up and walk on water. Simeon, you haven't seen him give sight to the blind. Simeon, you haven't seen him multiply fish and bread and feed a nation. Simeon, you haven't seen that, Simeon. Simeon, you, you haven't felt the hand of Christ when you were down on your knees crying. Simeon, you haven't been in a situation where you lost your job and he, you called out on the name of Jesus and he, and he came through and brought you peace. Simeon, how are you so peaceful right here? You haven't even experienced Jesus yet. Simeon, you haven't, you haven't felt what it feels like to have a, a disease and, and yet you have the peace of Christ and so you're okay. Simeon, you're just holding a baby. Why are you rejoicing? Why do you have so much peace? Why are you not fear, afraid of death? Because Simeon was trusting in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that Christ was the one. It was the Holy Spirit that showed him who Jesus was. In other words, to, to use the words of Paul and the Corinthians, it was spiritually a praise. See, my brothers and sisters, the only reason that you love Jesus right now, that you can see him clearly, is because the Holy Spirit has revealed him to you. Just like he did to Simeon. Just like Zacharias when he says he's prophesying in the Spirit. The only reason... It's because the Holy Spirit has revealed the glory to you. That's why he can do that. The Holy Spirit gave him the confidence to see that this is God. That is the one. He's the one that's going to deliver you. In verse 30 and 32, I want you to notice something here. See me in cool New Testament scripture. He says, that God's salvation in verse 30 is going to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles, verse 32. And then now I want you to look at chapter 1 and look at verse 78 through 79. Look at Zacharias. I want you to see if you see any commonality here. Simeon said here that God's salvation will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And then in 78, Zacharias filled with the same Holy Spirit, says, because of the tender mercy of God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. See, prior to you encountering Jesus, you were in darkness, just like first century Israel. Just like Simeon, Mary, and Zacharias, you were looking for a savior. You were looking for somebody to come and change the pain, somebody to take away the darkness in you. You were just like them. The problem is, we were looking in the wrong place. See, we were looking in political parties and presidential candidates hoping that they would deliver us. Do you know how many people had their faith tied up in President Obama because they thought he was going to be the savior and change things? And, and, and I remember President Obama, he, he said, um, and it's one of his opening speeches, he started by saying, I was not born in a manger because people were making him the Messiah. He, people were saying he was going to change things. 
See, we are all looking for a savior. We realize there's something wrong in us. There's, there's something wrong in this world. And so we're looking any place, looking for somebody to deliver us. If you weren't looking in presidential candidates and political parties, then you were probably looking in wealth and success, yes. hoping that it would deliver you and make things right. If you weren't looking in that, you were probably looking into your husband or your wife or your children or your family, hoping that they would make things right, hoping that you would find your satisfaction there. But guess what? All of these things make for bad saviors. All of these things make for bad messiahs. Why? Because they do not solve the problem. It is only Jesus, the light of the world, who dispels darkness. He's the only one that could bring life into you. And this is why Simeon's joy should be your joy as you reflect on the birth of Christ. He's the one that's changed you. He's the one that's dispelled the darkness. He's the one that's given you strength. He's the one that's reconciled you to, to God. He's the one who has bared your sins on a cross. That is why your joy should be Simeon's joy at Christmas. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for your goodness unto us. God, we thank you for sending your son, our salvation, to give us light, to allow us to see not just our sinful state and how we are so far separated from you, but God, how we can be reconciled to you. Lord God, I pray that you bless my brothers and sisters by your word. Allow your word to just say in their spirit as they go forward on this day, recognizing and realizing what you have already done for them. We stand redeemed and righteous because of you, God. It's your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.